Let's talk about the Lord's Supper. You may have heard it called the Eucharist or Holy Communion or Communion or Breaking of Bread. Um, we most typically call it Communion or the Lord's Supper here at our church. What comes to mind when you think of the Lord's Supper? Well, first of all, let's, as we get into this, let's talk about all the terms that we use when we talk about the Lord's Supper. Um, Eucharist is another name for Holy Communion or the Lord's Supper. It comes from Greek. Uh, I don't even want to say that. We'll put it on the screen <laughs> called Thanksgiving. The elements of the Lord's Supper are the bread and the wine or the wafer and the juice. So I've got some pictures up here so you can see this first picture. In some churches, the members stay seated and the elements are passed to them as they sit, kind of like the offering plate is passed. And the members wait until they're instructed by the person, like the pastor, and they all take communion. They all take the wafer together at the same time and they all take the body, uh, the juice at the same time. Um, at Christ Church and before COVID, we practiced intinction. That means we would come forward and they would have a, um, a goblet with juice in it and you would dip the wafer in the juice. That's called intinction. See the picture there? Okay, and now we sort of do that since COVID. We have the little juice glasses and so you go forward and you take, they hand you a wafer and then they hand you the juice. So those are the ways that you take. There, I'm sure there's other ways, but those are the ways that I wanted to discuss today about how you take communion. Churches have different views on who may take communion. Um, my friend Diane has a really funny story of being called out for taking communion during the funeral at a Catholic church. You'll have to ask her about it, it was pretty funny. Um, there is open communion. That means that all believers present when a local church observes communion may partake. That's what we do here at Christ Church. And then there is close communion. And that's the view, I'm gonna read it, that maintains only those who are saved, properly baptized, and in fellowship with a church of like faith and order, meaning holding the same basic doctrine as observing the church, they may um, sit at the Lord's table. And then finally, there is closed communion. And that is the most restrictive position, asserting that since communion is connected to the discipline, only members of the local church can partake. Now that we understand the different views that churches hold on who may take communion, let's look next at the four different views on the nature of this church sacrament so that we can better understand our Lord's intent at His Last Supper with His disciples. I also want to say personally, I've had family members or people that I know and love have visited our church and when communion is offered, even though we have open communion and they're baptized believing Christians, they won't take communion because I think they misunderstand what our church, um, the view that we hold and what it means. So there are four views on the meaning of the Lord's Supper. It is tr transubstantiation, co-substantiation, is that right? And memorial and spiritual meaning. So the first one, transubstantiation is the Roman Catholic position um, that's been around since the year 1215. Okay. That means that during the Eucharist, the bread is changed, literally changed. This view holds that it's literally changed into the body and blood of Christ. A final word about transubstantiation is that all Protestant churches reject this view. We do not believe that the elements of the Lord's Supper change into the body and blood of Christ. We reject that. Co- or consubstantiation. Martin Luther, remember him, Protestant Reformation. Okay. Co-consubstantiation, I'm going to read this, is the view that the bread and the wine of communion, the Lord's Supper, are spiritually the flesh and blood of Jesus, yet the bread and the wine are still actually only bread and wine. In this way, it's different from transubstantiation in which the bread and wine are believed to actually become the body and blood of Jesus. Transubstantiation is a Roman Catholic dogma that stretches back to the earliest years of the church, while consubstantiation is a relatively new arising out of the Protestant Reformation. Consubstantiation essentially teaches that Jesus is with, in, and under the bread and wine, but is not literally the bread and the wine. One final thing I want to say about consubstantiation is that is a view held by Lutherans. Okay, then third we have memorial. Okay, this is a view of many non-sacramentalist Baptist churches, okay? Um, this position is that the Lord's Supper is a memorial of Christ's death. Okay? Being located in heaven, Christ's body cannot be present in the sacrament. 
Moreover, moreover Christ, Christ's words of the institution, this is my body, are figurative and can't be taken literally. So the more memorial view stands against transubstantiation and consubstantiation. And most importantly, um, Jesus commanded, do this in remembrance of me. That's why this view is the memorial do, view. We were remembering what Christ did on the cross to accomplish salvation. Okay, the final view is the view that we as Presbyterians in the Reformed tradition hold, and that is spiritual presence. Okay, it's the view that um, it moves beyond the memorial view. It maintains that the bread and the wine are certainly symbols, just like the memorial view, but they are not empty symbols. They render what they symbolize. By this spiritual presence, Christ presents himself as and his saving benefits through these means of grace. Um, how Christ can be located in heaven and spiritually present in the Lord's Supper is ultimately a mystery, but Calvin, John Calvin, invoked the power of the Holy Spirit to unite Christ in heaven with the church on earth. Okay, so the benefits of this sacrament include participation with Christ, church unity, and nourishment towards sanctification. So now that we know a bit of the technical parts of the Lord's Supper, we're going to listen to another expert tell us about um, the beauty and significance of it, particularly the Presbyterian tradition of it being spiritual significance. So let's watch our video. Okay, welcome to Foundations. This is our lesson on the Lord's Supper or Holy Communion. So today we have sitting with us the Reverend Master John Standridge uh, here to explain to us uh, some of the important parts of the Sacrament of the Lord's Supper. All right. Uh, so I suppose with that in mind, um, John, what are the things we need to know about the Lord's Supper? Well, the most important thing is it's one of two sacraments uh, that were appointed by Jesus for the church for its life and its benefit. Um, the other sacrament is baptism. Um, in our understanding, a sacrament is uh, that which points to uh, the saving benefits of Jesus. It's like a, a, it's a fancy word for sign, um, and it works that way. It works like any sign. You um, say you're driving down the road and you see a sign and it says, uh, you know, Santa Fe up ahead. Um, you don't pull off the road and go, where is it? You go, oh, it's up ahead. I'm looking toward it. And in, in the same way, that's the way the sacraments function. You know, we have uh, the Lord's Supper that points to uh, Jesus, points to his, uh, what he did when he saved us. And so um, that's effectively, you know, at its most basic way, that's what it is. Uh, it, it's a sign, but it's, it's more than that. It's also a seal. Um, and it's a seal in this way that it, uh, it, it sticks to you. Um, so you can think about like an old uh, wax seal, like, like a king might use, um, where they would dip a, a thing in, in wax and they would write a letter and then they would stick it on there to show that, you know, to close up the envelope, but also to show this is the real thing. It's really coming from the king. Um, and that's uh, what uh, the sacrament is as well. That's how the Lord's Supper works, that you would know that this is a gift from the King uh, to you for your life. And uh, it's significant, it's a meal, um, that we would participate in it, we would partake. Uh, so people who believe in Jesus partake of the benefits of Jesus by eating that meal. Um, we eat bread and we drink juice or wine to be reminded that uh, Christ's salvation is our life, uh, that we um, are, you know, that, that we're sustained in our life because of what Jesus did. And so um, that's, that's it in a nutshell. Um, so I suppose the next question on my mind is uh, where do we fall in, in what we believe communion means? There's a lot of different traditions out there and ways we can practice it. Uh, how do we practice? Yeah, there are a lot of different traditions. I mean, I always like to emphasize that, um, you know, across the traditions we share a lot in common. And so um, every Christian church celebrates the Lord's Supper in some way. And that's really important, that every church um, understands that it's a sacrament, uh, that it's for our spiritual benefit, that it's one of the ways you identify a church, 
You know, you, the church is, um, you, you know it's a church because they practice the sacraments. And uh, that means it's not just a, a gathering of people for some other purpose, but you're gathered there as God's people um, for him, for his glory, for the good of your neighbors. So, you know, we shared all that. Um, but there are some differences uh, in terms of how we view it. There's some kind of classic categories. One is a memorial view. So uh, there's, there's traditions that would say, um, because Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me, what we're doing is we're, our main thing that we're doing is we're just kind of gathering together and having a solemn moment where we're remembering Jesus. Um, there's other traditions that would put, you know, um, a different emphasis on it and say they would put a real emphasis on because Jesus said, this is my body. Uh, uh, they would say, you know, that Jesus becomes somehow physically present in the bread or in the wine. Um, that's a really important emphasis for those traditions. Uh, our tradition is... Uh, Basically, we would say that Jesus is really spiritually present in the meal. And there's a couple of reasons why we think that, or why we believe that. One is Jesus is ascended unto heaven. Uh, he sits at the Father's side, at, at the right hand of the Father. Jesus has a resurrected body. Um, that's where his body is, and his body will return. And so when we look at him talking about the bread and the wine, we understand that he was saying, you know, this is... Uh, uh, again, it's a sign. It's not Jesus. It's pointing to Jesus like a sign would. Again, like you wouldn't pull over to the side of the road and go, where's Santa Fe? You're going, oh, it's, this sign's pointing me to Santa Fe. And so in the same way, the Lord's Supper works that way. Um, but we would also say that because of Jesus' promise that I am with you to the end of the age, that, uh, that he solemnized the covenant meal that we take together, that he has promised his real spiritual presence in that meal. And uh, that, we're, that we're not eating just any old meal, but we're eating a meal with promises attached to it. So we believe that he's really spiritually feeding us. So on the one hand, we're not um, just having a special moment where we're remembering Jesus. But on the other hand, we understand that Jesus is at the Father's right hand and spiritually communicating himself to us uh, and present with us in that way. And so, so that's kind of, that's where we sit in our tradition. But again, I would always want to emphasize that, you know, like every Christian tradition, we believe that meal to be of great spiritual importance, for it to be a meal for the body of Christ to partake in. Uh, Paul calls it in 1 Corinthians 10, a participation in the body, a participation mm -hmm. in the blood. And so um, that's why we would say uh, it's really important that you eat that meal as one who has faith in Jesus. Um, and it doesn't have to be great faith. It can be mustard size, mustard seed size faith but that you're putting your trust in him and you're coming hungry and thirsty, understanding that he'll deliver on his promises in that meal. So, does that That's make good. sense? It makes perfect sense. All right. I love it. It's good. Okay, so John, I have a question. Um, I came up, I was raised in a different tradition, mm -hmm. um, the more of the memorial tradition. Me too. And um, so could you maybe talk a little bit on what should the posture of our heart be when we come to the Lord's mm -hmm. table? Yeah. Yeah, so I grew up in a tradition like that too, and a lot of times before you would take the meal, there would be a lot of instruction about like if you have any um, unreconciled, unrepented of sin in your life, if, you're, if there are relationships that have gone badly that you need to work on, you know, don't partake of this meal until all of that is settled. Um, and so um, I, I would, I would, First of all, I think sometimes people just feel that conviction on their own, and, and if that's their conviction, I would say that's not a terrible conviction, you know, maybe, maybe act on that. Um, but I wouldn't give that as an instruction uh, because of the nature of the meal. Um, the, the meal is for sinners. Um, it's not for the perfect. It's for the hungry and the thirsty. And so, you know, I think... Jesus built into the Lord's Supper the understanding that the people taking it are sinful people. And I would actually say that if you're coming as you ought to, which means you know, you're coming understanding that Jesus is your life, uh, that he is the one who has uh, saved you from your sins, that partaking of that meal could actually be the thing that would nourish you to go and do that kind of thing. Oh, that's to, good. to actually feed upon Christ and to deepen the conviction 
of what Jesus has done for you in such a way that you would go, I do need to go and love my brother um, better than I have. I do need to go and reconcile with that person that I haven't reconciled with, um, you know, or whatever that thing may be. So, so I wouldn't say, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't give those kinds of instructions because if you're like me, and I, again, I, w- I grew up in a church like that, I think probably most Sundays I just would, have, would not have taken <laughs> the Lord's Supper because there's always something like that going on in my life. And I think the point of the meal is Jesus is feeding sinners, deepening their understanding of the gospel as a way to nourish his body so that that stuff would be happening. And so, to me, that would be that would be my emphasis. Um, you know, you you should say too, though. Like, and I don't want to get too in the weeds on this, but there are occasions where a church will, you know, in the shepherding of a particular member, um, kind of, you know, as a part of a process, and really toward the end of a process, if someone is really defiant and saying, "I'm not going to live as God's called me to live," mm-hmm. there are rare occasions where a church leadership might say, "You know, we want to tell you." Uh, now, you know, that, that we think maybe you shouldn't take the Lord's Supper uh, for a while until you can work that out, until we can walk through that together. So that is a thing. Um, but I would say it's more, you know, in extre- more extreme cases uh, where uh, the leadership of the church is dealing with a member in some really profound situation that needs real intervention. But as a normal part of life in a congregation, I wouldn't go that way. So. That's good. Thank you. Uh, so, John, um, yep. I grew up in this tradition, but even then I've heard different teaching from different people on mm-hmm. things. And I had someone tell me one time, um, if it were really a dire situation, mm-hmm. we could practice the Lord's Supper with Mountain Dew and pretzels. <laughs> okay. So that paints a different picture. I want to ask, why do we use bread and wine or bread and some yeah. grape derivative? Right. And why not Mountain Dew and pretzels? Yeah, well, um, I love Mountain Dew and pretzels as much as the next guy, and uh, I might modify it a little bit, maybe Dr. Pepper and Doritos, <laughs> something like that, if I was just going on my appetites. I, I mean, the simple answer is Jesus used bread and wine, and um, I think, you know, probably because those were sort of staple-type food for that time, and I think... Kind of the message behind that is probably something like, you know, this is just the basic stuff that we live on day to day. You could connect it with the Lord's Prayer, you know, give us this day our daily bread. Um, So I think there's something significant to that. Um, But I I wouldn't necessarily disagree with that guy. If you were in a dire situation and you didn't have anything else, I don't think the Lord's picky about, you know, too picky about the actual elements. You know, if you were in an emergency situation, if you're in a foxhole somewhere and your chaplain showed up and was administering the Lord's Supper to people, you know, outside of the normal situation, I think that would probably be okay. But, you know, um, I'd, I'd want to stick with bread and, bread and wine or bread and juice, um, mainly because that's just what the Bible, that's what Jesus did. And if we're able to do that, why not? Okay. Okay, so I have a question. Um, let's see if I can frame this correctly. Um, is it okay to have communion? with a gathering of people that's not necessarily church. Okay. Is it okay? Well, um, so I'm gonna just back, back into this a little bit by saying when you look in the Bible about instructions related to communion, it's, it's um, always in the context of it being a church. Um, so, you know, in 1 Corinthians 11, where Paul is providing instructions about taking the Lord's Supper, you know, it's kind of a classic text. It, that begins with the phrase, when you come together. Um, and so there's, that has a lot of connections. So for example, when you, in, in our tradition, when you join the church, the technical term for that is you are being admitted to the sealing ordinances. Well, what does that mean? It means that you're becoming a communing member um, as an adult. Or, so what, that's all connected to the supper. Um, there's a real concern in the Bible that, that we function as a body. Um, and there's a real problem that we're always trying to pull away as a, as a body mm-hmm. and do kind of our own thing. And so, so I, I, you know, I think there are situations where um, you know, your communion is being given outside of a church context. So 
you know, for example, when I was planting a church, I used to go to a nursing home uh, and, and give communion to people who couldn't come to church. But you know what I would do? I would stand up in church the Sunday before, and I would invite the whole church to come. And I would say, we're doing this on this day, at this time. Anyone want to come? This is your brother, your sister in Christ. We partake mm -hmm. of this meal together. It's a family meal, and uh, we don't want to leave anyone out. We don't want to do our own thing. Um, so, you know, there are situations where I think, you know, you can, you can give communion outside of the context of church. We've kind of been in one of those lately where we can't all meet together. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, and there's been, I think, a lot of good flexibility on, you know, taking communion in our homes and, you know, but it's still with the understanding that what's binding us together is, um, you know, is among other things, the Lord's Supper. Um, the sacraments, the preaching of the word, you know, those are, that's kind of the connective tissue. And um, where a lot of stuff goes awry in the Bible is when we all begin to kind of go, well, I'm doing my own thing, mm -hmm. you know? And that was, I mean, that's actually the context of those instructions in 1 Corinthians 11. You know, Paul's saying, you know, some of you are running up here and you're eating all the bread and you're drinking all the wine and some of you are getting drunk and others of you aren't getting anything. And so, you know, the impulse there I think is like, no, we want to do this together as a, as a family meal, as a meal uh, of God's people. And, uh, you know, in a way that is, um, is working toward the good of the community. Other thing, I think, is the importance of seeing that the preaching of the word, preaching sermons is connected to the meal. We kind of, it's all of, of a piece. It's all connected. Mm -hmm. And so um, we want to we wanna not only uh, take the Lord's Supper, we want to hear the, the, the Lord's word taught. And so that we're, in a way, we're kind of hearing the word, but then we're kind of eating it, you know, <laughs> together, um, being good. fed in our hearts and in our bodies and, and in a really holistic way. So, so I would say norm normally, you know, it, it ought to be done in the context of a church, um, but there are other situations where, you know, I think there's some flexibility when you're trying to accommodate people who can't be there. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. That's great. Uh, that's all so awesome and great to hear, um, but I have one last question. Okay. Uh, why does it matter that we do communion? Why is it special that I go and partake? Yeah. I think it matters because our hearts are shaky uh, and we um, often forget God's love for us. Mm -hmm. And we often want to make a life for ourselves. And I'm talking about even Christians, right? Like, I just, I just lapse into this place where I wonder if God loves me. I wonder if he cares for me. Um, and not only that, but then I try to kind of care for myself and love myself. And that's always profoundly disappointing <laughs> um, and the source of a lot of my failure. And what the Lord's Supper does is it, it is an objective, real, participation in the body and blood of Jesus with his promises attached to it, which um, tells me week in, week out, that I'm not as faithful as I'd like to be, but Jesus is always faithful. And so whatever's going on that week, I can look back and go, whatever the ups and downs of my week have been, I know this, that the Lord invited me to his table and he fed me there, and he's going to do that again next week. And so um, it's just, a, to me, really critical to my life. And this is why I love that we do it every Sunday here. And that um, I just know I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be with my family, my fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. And Jesus is one of us. And uh, that he is going to um, remind me of the gospel that I often forget. And he's going to not only do that, he's going to feed me mm -hmm. um, physically, spiritually, and um, so that, that, that to me is probably the biggest thing of why it matters. Hmm. Well, those are all such uh, great things. And I think it really does well to grow our, our mind in what God is doing and accomplishing uh, in such an awesome practice that we're able to partake in. Mm -hmm. um, so there's so much more that we're going to talk about and uh, answer. Um, but for now, we'll see you guys next time. Bye-bye. Our pastors say every week at Communion, if you are a baptized believer who has placed your faith in Christ, please come partake of the Lord's Supper. 
And if you have not placed your faith in Christ, please take him instead. So you may have some practical questions as to what the Lord's Supper means and who can take it. Um, so I'm going to give you two scenarios. Okay, the first scenario is you have a young child who was baptized as an infant, yet has not yet professed faith in Christ. Should they take communion? No. Once they have professed faith in Christ, they may take communion. And this will not be the same for everyone. At Christ Church, our elders are authorized, um, excuse me, at Christ Church, our elder, elders have authorized parents to discern when their baptized children have faith. Pastor Greg adds, it would probably be, probably be much better to add the step of a very short, simple meeting with one of the pastors. Okay, and that the, the reason for that is the goal is to um, make this important decision to trust Christ a little more significant um, and clear in the mind of the child. Okay, he goes on to say, I still want to err on the side of letting very young kids come, even if they have a very young faith. Example, do you love Jesus? Yes. Do you know he loves you like mommy and daddy do? The second scenario is you were not baptized as a child, but have now placed your faith in Christ, which is beautiful. We ask that you first meet with one of our pastors to talk about it. Then they're going to schedule a time for you to be baptized and then take communion. We believe this is the Bible's teaching. You can't eat until you're born, first new birth by water, and then feast at the table regularly. If you're interested in being baptized or meeting with our pastors, please call our church office and schedule an appointment with them. We'd love to hear from you. I hope this lesson on the Lord's Supper has been helpful. And perhaps maybe you see this sacrament in a new way that will deepen your faith and your love for God. This meal, remember that John, as John said, this meal is for sinners, the hungry and the thirsty, not for the perfect. So we come understanding that Jesus is our life. He saved us from our sins and partaking of the Lord's Supper nourishes us so that we can then go and bear fruit that glorifies God. That's it. Thank you.